If you have your Bibles in Acts chapter 15, we saw early on in the book of Acts uh, that the church was uh, congregational in government in this sense that in Acts chapter 1, you remember after the death of Judas, they said, well, we have to choose somebody to replace Judas, and they chose Matthias. And so within the church, they chose, they prayed, chose, anointed Matthias, and so on. Well, we see a little later in Acts chapter 6 that uh, there was needs in the church. Uh, some of the widows were being neglected in the daily ministration, and so uh, the congregation came to the apostles, and they said, well, uh, there's a need here, and so the apostles set forth some parameters and, and says, well, you're going to choose men out from you, seven men of honest report, four of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And we see here that the apostles asked the congregation, the Bible says the whole multitude of the disciples, to participate and to choose so that means that the church operated congregationally within boundaries. You see, it's not, we talked about last time how the church is not a democracy in the pure sense to where the church says, all right, let's get a consensus. And then let's, whoever is, uh, whoever's got the most percentage on the consensus, then that's what we'll do. No, the church does not operate by consensus. It operates by the word of God where every member submits to the Word of God, and that's how the church, that's where unity is found, right? Uh, today, the emphasis is on unity itself. Um, unity is only found around the truth. The truth is only found in God's Word. And so we, uh, we find unity by being submitted and obedient to the truth of God's Word. The parameters were, first of all, seven men. The number. They have to be honest. They have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. They have to be filled with wisdom. And then they were to be appointed over a specific business. And notice, while the congregation were all involved, they had to bring those seven men to the apostles, and then the apostles had to appoint them. And so the parameters were pretty clear there, right? It's not a democracy in that, well, do what you want. Choose who you, whoever you will, and you choose the parameters. That's not the way it was. So uh, it was to operate within certain boundaries. Um, that's Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 6. We come to Acts chapter 15, and so when we look at those earlier chapters, it's only one church, the church of Jerusalem. At that point, you find the church, the word church used singular, in the singular form, the church at Jerusalem. When the persecution came, it arose specifically after the stoning of Stephen, when he died. The Bible says the, the, the people were scattered abroad. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. And then you begin to see that now there's not one church in Jerusalem, but there are churches now in Judea and in Samaria. And uh, you find the gospel spreading. And then later you find the church of Antioch. The church of Antioch, remember, was started as a result of the persecution. The believers, the church at Jerusalem, sent Barnabas, you remember, to teach the people there. Barnabas asked Paul, the apostle Paul, who was in Troas at that time, to come down to Antioch and to teach the people. And so in Antioch, now you have this other church, and Barnabas and Paul are the two main teachers within that local church. And uh, they were there for a number of, uh, 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 for a large amount of time, but then God, or the Holy Spirit, moved in the church of Antioch to select Paul and Barnabas to send them out to start churches. Mainly the first missionary journey, they would go through Asia Minor, then they would come back to Antioch. After the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas come back to Antioch, which is their church, and they hear that some believers in Jerusalem had come up to the church of Antioch and had taught them something that was against the scriptures or against the truth that the apostles had, had taught. So Acts chapter 15 is that documentation. Now we think, right, what was the first church in the book of Acts? Where was it? The church of Jerusalem. Uh, at that time, you think about the apostles in Jerusalem, you think of them as the authority figure, but the congregation, you see them participating as a whole. 
So Paul and Barnabas, they're in Antioch. They're, that's their church. They were sent out of that church. After the, their journey, they came back to that church to give a report of all that God had done. And when they hear of this doctrine, they think, well, that's what they've said in Jerusalem. So the church of Jerusalem is not, in the sense, a Vatican. <laughs> it is not an authority over Antioch. And how do we know that? Because we see what happens. So notice with me in Acts 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea, now the, if you look at a map, it's uh, from Antioch, it's southward, but everything is downward from Jerusalem. The best you go up to Jerusalem and Judea, even though geographically it's down south. Uh, and so the men which came down from Judea, they, some men came down from Judea, Jerusalem, to go up north to uh, Antioch, they taught the brethren while wow, Paul and Barnabas were absent uh, and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Uh-oh. Well, we know that's not the truth. That's not what Paul and Barnabas have been teaching those believers. And so they're thinking, here is some men who come from the church at Jerusalem and they taught this doctrine. So what's the response? When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they uh, they were received of, of, of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying uh, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders, now again, it was needful for them to be circumcised to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Okay, that's what we saw in verse 1. Verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of, of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, uh, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Uh, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had brought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me, Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things." Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Now, just note on, we trouble not them. Verse 20, uh, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornications and from things stra uh, strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleaseth the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren, sending greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles of Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, whom shall also tell you the same thing, 
by mouth. So the letter here is, is pretty clear. Uh, it's going to be a letter sent uh, with Silas and Barnabas to the church of Antioch to say, we're not going to trouble you. We did not give authority to these men to come and to teach you those doctrines. Here is the struggle, and maybe we don't understand in the context of where it was. In Jerusalem, those who were saved, comprised of the church, were Jews. All of them were circumcised as Jews by virtue of their, their heritage. By the way, there's nothing wrong with being circumcised, but it is wrong for them to go up to the church of Antioch, which was primarily comprised of Gentiles, to tell them that they had to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses in order to be saved. And so what we find here then is when we think about the first church, the first church was not, when the church of Antioch was formed, was not to exercise authority over the church of Antioch. The church of Antioch acted independently of the church at Jerusalem. And even when it seemed, by all appearances, that they had sent people up there to teach them things that was contrary to what Paul and Barnabas had taught them, they came down and they says, is this true? And it was true. They says, well, you can't do that. And so we find here that the church of Jerusalem operated independently, and the church of Antioch also operated independently. Antioch did not have authority over Jerusalem, and Jerusalem did not have authority over the church of Antioch. They acted independently one of the other. And so the words we find here, right, we do not want to trouble you. Uh, they send a letter to Barnabas and, uh, uh, or with Paul and Barnabas through Silas, um, and uh, Judas, according to verse 27. And we see here that several things about the, the proof that churches in the book of Acts were independent congregations. We see the, think about it, first of all, there is no example throughout the entirety of the New Testament that the church was led or controlled by any other church or council, or hierarchy, or board, or convention, or fellowship, or an individual man who ran the affairs of another church. Uh, now, when we think about the New Testament, we say, okay, uh, Paul was writing to churches. Now, by the way, churches that he had established. But we understand that the, the Bible says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles. Are there apostles today? Well, no. They were in the first century. God, uh, we know there were apostles because they were witnesses of the resurrection, and God gave them signs and wonders to validate them. And so that's only happened in the book of Acts. The foundation has been laid. We understand that. And we find that all of those congregation operated independently one of another, but understanding that the apostles were the foundation. So when Paul wrote the, the letter to the church at Corinth, when he wrote the letter to the church at Rome, when he wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus and so on, and to the churches of Galatia, we know that all of those congregations operated independently, uh, but that the apostle Paul stands as the foundation of the church for the doctrine of the church. But you don't see any church exercising authority over another church, or you don't find a hierarchy or a convention or a board or a hierarchy that had authority over the church at Ephesus, over the church at Corinth, over the church at Jerusalem, and so on. When we understand the very nature of the church, the very definition of a New Testament church calls for independency. What does the word church mean? Right, a called out assembly. We look from the very beginning uh, when Jesus said, I will build my church in Matthew 18, the first thing he taught about the church was uh, about church discipline. When there's conflict between two brothers, if he's not going to hear you, bring two witnesses. If he doesn't hear those witnesses, then take it to the church. So the church has to be local. That's an understanding with the word church itself. True churches are local churches that are visible, organized, and local. And so there's no, no such thing as, well, the church, as in the Catholic sense, 
when they think the Catholic Church, they're thinking all churches, all Catholic buildings, that's the church. No, the church is a local assembly uh, in the very nature of the church. And so if it was the Lord's intention that churches have a centralized hierarchy, well, we could say that the Catholic model then would be ideal if there is a central hierarchy, but there isn't. There isn't. Even the first church in Jerusalem did not exercise authority over the church at Antioch. Uh, we also know that throughout the New Testament you find clearly stated that, the, that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The church of Jerusalem was not the head of the church at Antioch. Christ was the head of the church of Antioch. Uh, what is the highest authority? The, the, the scripture teaches uh, independency in Matthew 18, 17. Jesus says, tell it to the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be as unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. And so here we find that the local church uh, uh, itself is independent because no other authority beyond the church is mentioned. There is no authority beyond the, throughout the entirety of the New Testament there is no authority mentioned beyond the authority of the church. Um, we also see when we think about the apostles uh, throughout the book of Acts, um, the apostles uh, did not govern, for example, the other churches. You remember when Paul in Acts chapter 14, he goes throughout Asia Minor and he established churches and what does he do in every locality? He ordains elders in every church. Well, what is that? Well, uh, the word um, in 1 Peter chapter uh, 5, he says that uh, he uses the word bishop, elder, and pastor interchangeably. The word bishop means overseer, pro, pro, uh, uh, overseer uh, presider, uh, elder uh, has the same connotation. Now, it speaks of maturity, but it also talks about someone who presides over. And pastor, the word pastor is where we get the word feed, feed the flock. That's what is instructed there. And so that's where we get the word pastor today. And so that's what Paul did every in every locality. He put men who were presiders, who were overseers, who were pastors, who fed the people in each one of those localities. And he left that understanding that they were an authority unto themselves under Christ. Under Christ. It's interesting that when even when Paul, when he writes letters, he brings the church's attention to not himself, but Christ. He repeatedly says, the things I'm communicating to you, I've received by Jesus Christ. I'm not the authority over you, but this is God's will for you according to Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and so uh, when you look at Acts chapter 15, the, we could say the council at Jerusalem, uh, this gives us an account of a meeting between representatives of the church of Antioch and representatives of the church at Jerusalem over the issue of false doctrine. And when you look at this, the church at Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas and others as well with them to Jerusalem. We saw that in verse 2 and 3. Um, so think about it. So Paul, notice in verse 2 of Acts 15, uh, it says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other men should go up to Jerusalem. Who's the, they determined that Paul, who's the they? Ah, there you go. It's not Paul and Barnabas saying, oh, we're going to, no, no, the church says we need to send representatives. So Paul, think about it, Paul, even though he was the apostle to the Gentiles, was subject to his home church. He operated under the auspices, the authority of the church of Antioch, not under the authority of the church of Jerusalem. The church of Jerusalem was not saying, hey, Paul, you need to come down here because we need to make things right. No, the church of Antioch says, Paul, we're going to send you down there. The church of Jerusalem also received them. We see that, verse 4, the, the whole multitude in verse 12, with the whole church in verse 22. 
And um, I like what one, I um, think it's um, K.H. Good. he said that the presence of the apostles is a circumstance which cannot be duplicated today. These men are gone, and their authority has been transmitted to the scriptures for our use. However, it is of significance to note that the apostles did not hold a solemn and restricted uh, 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 meeting of their own to emerge later with an ex um, cathedra pronouncement. Right? Uh, if you notice, verse 4, the church received them. Verse 12, all the multitude. Verse 22, with the whole church. Right? So what happens today in the hierarchy is there's meetings that take place behind closed doors, right, in those hierarchies, Catholic Church. And then, you know, sometimes there's smoke that comes out, and then they determine, okay, they've, they've made a decision. No, no, it was not done in secret, behind closed doors. It was done before the entire congregation. Uh, the public debate over the false doctrine. And we also see that the church of Jerusalem did not impose its will upon the church at Antioch. Verse 19, we trouble them not. As they did, uh, all they did here was write and ask the Gentiles, who were in Antioch, who believed, to show deference to the Jews, to honor the Jews. In other words, it says, you don't have to be circumcised, but you should honor the customs of the Jews. And by the way, right, that's, that's really what Paul says later in his letter, uh, you know, to the Jew, I was as a Jew, the Gentiles, a Gentile, and, and so on. It's not saying that you get involved in sin. It says that uh, you honor people, their culture, as long as it's not against Scripture, uh, you don't, right? So, in other words, the Gentile was not to say, well, you ought not to be circumcised. It made no difference. It made no difference. But the Jews should not say that the Gentiles had to be circumcised, and so on. Just like the Gentiles should not say uh, to... Um, to the, to the Jew, well, uh, forget about God's, forget about the law. You don't, you live as you please. But the Jew could not say to the Gentiles, uh, you have to live in conformity to the law of Moses or else you can't be saved. Uh, so uh, there was uh, just honor the, the other. Um, we think about even the, you go in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you fa find the seven churches of Asia. Uh, it's interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ addressed himself through John to the angel, the messengers, the individual church, not to some central body of ecclesiastical authority. Right? Jesus, let, let's go there, just so, we, just so we're clear about this. Revelation. Notice uh, Revelation 2 verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works. So, Jesus Christ appears to John, and he says to John, Write these things on my behalf, John. And notice, there are seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3, and every single church receives a different letter, is going to receive a different letter for the things that they're dealing with in their individual churches. It's not, Jesus Christ didn't say, all right, John, I want you to write to the council at Jerusalem so that they can force those churches in Asia to do what I want them to do. That's not how I went. Every church was independent. Every church was autonomous. And every church, it's interesting that every church was commanded to do what in the end? Submit to Jesus Christ. Submit to His will. Submit to His doctrine. Uh, submit to His design that you would walk in holiness before Him. Every individual church. And again, it's, he says, write to the churches. And then when he says, the church at Ephesus. The church at Philadelphia. The church of the Laodiceans, individual churches. And so you see clearly in the New Testament, uh, you find this proof of independency. Now, what's the benefit? And I'll just give you those uh, very quickly here. But uh, why, what's the benefit of having this? Well, first of all, it maintains the headship of Christ. 
If you have a hierarchy that is outside the church, then the head is no longer Christ. If somebody outside the church says, well, this is what you must do, then you no longer have the opportunity to submit to Christ. You submit to another entity that is outside of that church. It also holds to true liberty. Uh, by the way, this is because there is no imposition of, a, of an alien will, a will upon a church or the hearts and lives of God's people. When churches become entangled with things such as um, you know, you think about the hierarchy or convention, cooperative, cooperative budgets, <laughs> where you, you're part of this entity and you have to give and you have no say in where the money goes, and where the money goes. Uh, by the way, that's why, by the way, we're not Southern Baptist. They send their funds to the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention sends those funds then to universities, and some of those are liberal universities who deny the veracity of the Word of God, some of them the deity of Christ, and salvation by grace through faith. Well, so they, they also have teachers that teach the right thing. I understand, but there are some that don't. I don't want to participate in that. Uh, also, it constitutes a bulwark against wholesale apostasy. Think about it. If the Catholic Church, which ha has been corrupted, is corrupt, has corrupted the gospel, all Catholic churches are corrupt. Period. They all believe the same thing. Now, there's uniformity, no doubt, but they're all corrupted. Guess what? If uh, we, we were started out of Capital Baptist Church, if Capital Baptist Church goes astray in false doctrine, it doesn't affect us. Why? Because they have no say over us. See, that maintains, it fights against the spirit of apostasy. Because now we're not forced to believe what some entity believes. We act independently. We, we're, we're free to follow the Word of God. So it's a bulwark against apostasy, right? So when the Catholic Church, for example, when the Pope decreed that if you kissed his feet, that you would have some measure of grace imparted unto you, all the Catholic Churches believe that at the same time. When they say you have to pray to Mary, all Catholic Churches believe that at the same time. Why? Because it came from the Pope. It was voted on in the council. Well, no. Right? We follow the word of God. And so, uh, really, the, the, the independency of the local church is a bulwark against a wholesale apostasy. But also, it permits a broad fellowship between uh, churches, that we can fellowship with churches. Now, here is the limitations within independency. You ready for them? There's limitation. In other words, we're not in a democracy in its purest form in the sense that, well, let's just get a consensus and do what we want. No, no. Here is the, the limitations. The Word of God, that's the limitation. The Great Commission, that's our work, what we're supposed to do. Uh, also, uh, Romans chapter 13 says very clearly, um, or um, uh, talks about the individual responsibility, uh, Romans 12 talks about the individual responsibility of every church member. And so there's an emphasis on individual soul liberty, the personal rights of each member, that every member is not a spectator, but he is a participant, is a participant. Now, I, I try to emphasize this, for example, when we have our meeting. When we sing, here's the reason why we now, there's nothing wrong with the group singing up here, right? We have groups. We have special music. But we don't have a praise team to stand on the platform and sing. You know, one of the reasons we don't do that is because we don't believe that we are spectators. We believe that everybody that comes to the, to the meeting is a participant. So we're not here to listen and to be entertained. We're here to worship God. And that's something we do. We don't have somebody do it on our behalf. So we don't have a praise team. We open the hymnal and we sing congregationally. When I start the meeting, I say, it's not just a cliche, I say, would you pray with me? Why? Because you're not here for me to entertain you with a soliloquy and a prayer. You're here to join me in prayer. We're here to bombard the throne of God together. Why? Because we're all participants. We're not spectators. And so that's emphasized in the idea of the, the local church. Um, but also we don't reject interdependency or cooperation. Uh, it's very clear throughout the New Testament that churches cooperated with one another. 
the basis of no cooperation was false doctrine. Right? Reject, separate from those who teach another doctrine. Uh, Paul made that very clear in the churches of Galatia. Right? When he talks about they were corrupting the gospel, he says, Cursed be anyone who teaches against the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we do, in other words, we cooperate with churches that believe the same that we do. So we don't, we're independent, but we cooperate.